around 2.50, we will begin. Again, um, hello everyone. Um, the travel team is here to help you guys. Um, welcome to the September or the autumn um, travel info meeting. Again, we do this meeting quarterly. Um, most likely the next one will be maybe December, January. Um, again, just wanna recommend everyone, if you have any questions, concerns, um, please put it into the Q&A. The chat is open, but we will only be answering questions from the Q&A. Um, it is also enabled for you guys to like each other's questions, answer each other's questions if you want as well. Um, we'll try our best to get through everything. Um, knowing how these meetings go, we'll most likely have more questions um, uh, during every slide. So if we don't answer everything, we will be sending out an email after this with the recording, which will be on a YouTube video, the um, slide deck, and then um, if necessary, a little Excel sheet with the rest of the Q&A, okay? So with, uh, with that, we'll start. Again, you have me, Sam, one of the two compliance analysts, and we also have Renee Flores here, my partner in crime, uh, my manager here, Teresa Athen, and then um, we will begin. Okay. So really quick, um, our agenda. So uh, we're gonna start with Jesse Rice from ISC talking about uh, budgets and accounting dates update. Uh, next will be the non-employee travel claim form update and discussion. So um, the form 3.0. And then we'll move on to the 9-8 survey results that was sent from the previous uh, listserv or mailing list. Uh, next will be the CBT guest booking update, then the workday best practices and any submitted questions. And then lastly, after all those slides, we will do an open Q&A. So let's get started. Okay, so Jesse, uh, you may uh, take the floor. I'll stop sharing. Good. Um, okay, so I just wanted to talk briefly about the expense reports and budget dates. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show you all an example of an expense report. Um, so I have an expense report here in Workday. Um, and essentially, when you're creating an expense report, you'll notice that you create an expense report with an expense report date. Um, and typically, people have been making this date be the date that they're actually creating it on. Like these are often matching almost all the time. Um, and then the expense lines, um, folks are putting in the date of the expense, which makes sense. Um, and so just to give you a little bit of background on what's happening in Workday. So if I actually click on the related actions button here for the expense report, and I go down to accounting and I want to view the accounting, I'm gonna open this up in a new tab. Um, so looking at this um, here, I can actually see what's called the operational journal information. So this is kind of the accounting journal that's happening in the background after you process your expense report. And so you'll notice that if I come down here to the journal lines and I scroll over, I'm gonna see that the budget date on the expenses is 8-3-23. Um, and that date, is lining up with the expense report date, not with the expense date itself of 7-11-23. Um, and so the reason that this matters or that you might care about this is because this budget date, it's what's being used to determine if this expense falls within your award period. So for instance, if your award had ended on 7-31, um, and this expense was processed uh, with on 711. Um, because workday is picking up on this 83 date, it would fall outside of your award period. And um, you would get when you're looking at the billing or when GCA is looking at the billing, they'd see that this expense is not eligible to bill because it falls outside of the award dates. So what we're doing and the security team, is updating this um, as we speak, is they're updating the accounting to follow um, 
what's happening here at the expense line. So within a couple of days, once you start submitting expense reports, it's going to start picking up that expense date as the budget date instead of how it's working right now, which is it's picking up the expense report date. Um, so you may see some messages from GCA. Um, they have the ability to edit these budget dates. And so they've been going in. Uh, some of you already have reached out to GCA and worked with them to edit some of the budget dates on your expense reports um, to move them to the appropriate period so that they fall within the award line period. Um, and so that's pretty much it. Um, it was a quick thing to present on today. I can see if there's a few questions in the Q&A that I can answer. Um, okay, these are all more for the travel team. Looks like there's one at the end, T. Haynes. Oh, uh, what is the award date? Um, so the award date, when I say award date, I'm referring to like the award period. So here, if this expense, for example, um, is being charged to this grant here. Um, so if I go ahead and I open up my grant, um, and then from my grant, I want to go to the award. So I'm gonna go here to the award. If I look at the award line for that grant, so let's see, what grant was it? 27253. So if I look for that here, I see that it's this one. So I see that my uh, award line dates for this grant are from 10-1-2021 through 9-30-2023. So that's what I meant is that Workday is saying that if your budget date falls within these dates, then it's okay, it's eligible to be charged to the sponsor. But if it falls outside of these dates, then that expenditure is deemed to not be allowable to the sponsor because um, the contractual terms of the award said that, you know, you had until this date to spend on the award. And so because we're seeing um, this budget date issue, we're having PCA fix some of them. Um, and we're also uh, changing the settings in Workday to pick up on this expense line, which is more intuitive setting. Um, yeah. So that's the kind of looking at the award date. Um, let's see if there's any, these seem to be all for the travel team. Um, no, I, I wouldn't recommend using the date of the expense um, as standard practice. This, this should be changed within a day or two um, in workday. So I, I would recommend just kind of continue doing what folks have already been doing, um, which is the more intuitive thing of putting the expense date as the actual date of the expense. And you can just make the expense report date the day that you're creating it. Um, so that should be changed really soon. This is just more of a heads up so folks can kind of understand what's going on in the background. And if you are going to run into any errors um, for expenses that were, you know, created before around, you know, September 28th today, you can know what's going on and you can kind of like understand that issue a little bit better. Um, are you saying that we need to contact PCA? Um, I had this issue with a war that was perfectly good within the award date and give me error about budget date. Yes, so exactly. If, if the error is exactly like, you know, what I just presented now, it's because of the budget date on an expense report, then I would definitely submit an award portal ticket to GCA or a UW Connect ticket. Um, and tell them that you need that budget date changed. Um, so we don't need to change the practice of putting the current date on the report, the budget date. Um, no, so yeah, you, you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't need to change the way you're doing things. Um, and should we backdate the report? No, yeah. Um, how do we check the award period before process the ER and workday? Uh, to check the award period, you would do what I just did. You would type in your grant number or your award number. You would go and you would look at the from and to date on the line. You can also see the overall award period here at the top. So this award is from all the way from 9-1-2013 through 9-30-2023. Um, okay, and it looks like that's it. So I'll hand it back to the travel team. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jesse. Um, if you guys have more questions for Jesse, 
just let us know in the Q&A um, and we will reach out to him. But um, Jesse, you're free to go. If you'd like to stay, it's up to you to be respectful of your time. Good, thanks. Thank you. Let me share screen once again. Okay. Oh, I guess we'll go to the survey results. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry about that, guys. Oh, the form, there we go. So really quick, um, we did update our form. So if you wanna call it a new updates 3.0, um, it is available on the forms page. We'll quickly go through it, um, but just as a heads up to the second bullet point that the older forms, uh, the one that was originally originally made on June 6th and then our update on uh, July 7th um, are no longer going to be accepted um, 10.5. I know we mentioned it in our um, mailing list email, um, but we're giving a hard stop on October 5th, which is a week from today. So if you have submitted anything with the older forms, that is fine until October 5th. So, but really quick, let's go over um, the form. Um, nothing major changes, but just a little bit deleted things here and there that are not necessary for uh, a non-employee travel. Okay. One second. Okay, let me zoom in a little bit. Okay, so it doesn't look too different. We did change a little bit of wording up here, but again, um, I'll just go through everything just to refresh everyone's minds about the form. Um, we really um, require everyone to fill out the travel information, trip information. We did um, put in red one of these three selections. So please make sure you input that. Um, we want to make sure um, location, city and state is there. I know some of um, you guys are putting box number not there or not. That is fine as long as um, uh, it is filled out for the other field. We want to make sure everyone fills out this field, with, which is US citizen or green card holder, yes or no. Um, and then in the trip information, um, we want to make sure we include um, the event or UW business name and the location, which is city and state or city and country if it's um, outside the US. Right here, super important. Again, travel start and end date is basically travel status start and end date. So they should align, um, especially for the time. A lot of people are asking for reimbursement for meal per diem and a missed payment, but they don't put the time. So we can't figure that out. So again, make sure we fill out uh, both travel date and start time and end time as well. But I know the biggest one, again, we're still having this concern, is personal time. Again, please select yes or no. If you do select yes, you need to also put the location, start, and end time. Next, we move down here. Um, registration, our professional fees. Please click one or the other or both. And then um, it says required here, so just make sure it's either required in the um, MP or on file with the department. For airfare, the only thing we really did is to remove the CTA option. It's not really relevant to here. If you do put the airfare on there, that's up to you guys. But again, um, we won't be checking for that since um, it's not going to be reimbursed. For baggage fees, still the same. Ground transportation, still the same. There are options here, so just make sure you choose the correct option. 
the food with the cost, check if it's uh, the receipt is there or not, and then of course the business purpose if necessary. Um, for mileage, it is right here. Same thing as before. Again, this is up to date with a 0.655 lodging. And the only thing we updated on here was, I know it said conference hotel, and then the second one down here said conference hotel uh, documentation. We've changed that to non-UW traveler. Um, so again, this is here for you guys. Um, just a reminder that conference hotel and non-UW traveler are uh, the only two except, uh, uh, exceptions that allow uh, over 150% to per diem. Next for the meals, um, everything is mostly the same other than um, there was a selection here saying, if you didn't know the per diem, you can check this box and we'll, on our end, we'll manually calculate. We did remove that. We do want everyone to input um, meal per diem into the boxes. So just so you know, um, if, you want to, you can, if you know they're getting full, if they are getting full per diem the whole time through, you can do like every, like one day per week, not one day per week, but like the Monday or the Sunday of that week, and then the Monday and Sunday of the next week, and just put the full per diem all calculated here. We're going to check it either way. We want to make sure everything is aligned. And then other miscellaneous is still here. Um, but yeah. That's the updated, not too different 3.0 version. Again, if you guys have any feedback, please let us know. Um, but again, this is required in order to be not taxed on non-employee travel. Okay, let me move back to the presentation. All righty, so let's now switch gears and have more of a discussion in the chat just you know person to person here we sent this uh survey out with the 98 info list email asking about what we think about the uh 75% rule if we could uh get on there and uh so essentially we just wanted to kind of gauge what is uh what are people's concerns about switching to 75% rule? 75% being instead of the current meal per diem time intervals of entering travel status, exiting travel status, we would just adopt 75% of a full day's meal per diem on start and end dates. The reason behind this is because a workday is not able to automate this as Ariba did. And we are finding that uh, that seems to be the case, even with our partners and other universities who had the same process for who've had workday for years. And we found that this survey is kind of a little close, with uh, the nos being fifty four percent and the y the yeses being forty six percent. So, if in the chat you guys could just let us know kind of what what your thoughts are on this, or if you have other possible suggestions for this. Mainly, we we see a lot of, right now we're having to, we're having travelers calculate this or employees calculate this manually and input meals on, or input 
the correct meals that travelers are eligible for by marking them as provided on the so I see a lot of people saying keep current system, but I want to know why. Give me more details, please. So points four is we see a lot of people not calculating this correctly or not doing it, and we're having to send these back. And uh, we don't review everything, so we wonder you know, how it's going with the other ones. So I see we do. We are getting a lot of stuff here. That's great. So yeah, we'll likely send out a revised survey after this and we'll kick around some other ideas. But thank you everybody for responding to the survey and for your input. And uh, I think that's just kind of it. All right, excellent. And I will say the 75% rule is the way the federal government does it. It is a federal requirement or federal policy. So it would be a policy change essentially. But anyway, all right, we can move on now. Okay. Um, a lot of people were looking forward to this little update. I guess this will also kind of be a discussion as well. Um, so just gonna let it out there. So we have been notified by our CBT uh, partner that there have been an increase of fraud uh, for guest bookings through uh, the booking tool. Um, not just theirs, but also other travel agencies. And as uh, we don't want to put UW to risk, uh, we uh, come to the decision to disable the guest booking option on the online booking tool only. So again, departments or whoever uh, within the university are still able to book for guest bookings. It's just through a travel agent. So it's not fully disabled. Um, I know we've been getting strong feedback and we're again, open to all feedback. So if you have anything to note, please let us know in the chat. But again, we do not want to put you to a risk at, of fraud because it actually has happened before um, um, to other people, or at least uh, people within the central office. And again, um, guest bookings will only be available for Christofferson not the other three, through a travel agent. Um, again, um, I know a lot of people are concerned about that, um, but again, um, that is the current decision we have made. I am happy and we are all happy to receive feedback about this, um, but again, we did not want to put you to that risk uh, due to the security features of CBT. So that is it for this slide. Um, I'm just gonna look, uh, CBT is Christofferson Business Travel. So again, um, just really quick, we have four uh, contracted travel agencies, CBT, Christofferson, um, CTM, Corporate Travel Management, Tangerine Travel, and then Key Travel. So this is one of the four um, that has this update. Okay. Um, we'll get to your questions since there's a bunch coming in. But if again, a reminder, any questions of those, um, if uh, please put into the Q and A. I know it's growing, but we'll get we'll try our best to get to every question today. Um, but they will be answered either way. Alrighty, so now let's start touching on some best practices we wanted to share with y'all regarding workday, expense reports, and miscellaneous payments regarding on travel. Don't worry, we will get to your questions and any future questions. Any future, any questions that we don't get to, we will uh, send, we'll answer them offline and send them out with the uh, follow-up email to the listserv. And as a reminder, this is, uh, this is recorded. So, uh, please make sure to send things back instead of denying if you are a reviewer. Denying ends the process, and uh, 
that the people would have to start over. And we've had some people kind of get them confused because I know Janai was essentially sent back in Ariba. So send back is the new, well, send back. Uh, so, and then we have a lot of questions regarding a duplicate lines error. So Workday tracks expenses for payees across all expense reports. So if you make an expense in a draft and you don't submit it, you decide to start over, but you leave that other one, Workday will consider the new expenses to be duplicates and will not allow you to submit it. So a workaround in case you can't find them or if in case someone else submitted a draft for this uh, employee and you're encountering the issue, you can use the R1126 report, fill in the payee name, and find all expense reports in draft or in progress status. And you can either cancel those or cancel yours, whichever one is the most correct. Okay, so ERs for non-workers versus miscellaneous payments. So Workday has a built-in non-worker functionality, but uh, it was deemed to not be in scope to be completed along with GoLive. Uh, we don't know the exact reasons why, as we were not privy to those conversations, but we will push for it later down the line once, you know, Workday gets a little more stabilized and the team has more bandwidth for these kinds of requests. But that is that is our hope to get non, non-employees non back in the ER module and not have to use our form eventually. But uh, for now, for all non-employees, whether... So if they're students, if they're not, if they're just regular students and not student employees, and all non-employees, please use the miscellaneous payments module using the form and our special spend category. For uh, now, let's talk about company versus company on expense line. So if you are with School of Medicine or UW Medicine, if you are submitting an expense report or a miscellaneous payment, please leave the company as. UW 1861. Company on expense line should be changed to whichever company you belong to, whether that be School of Medicine, UW Med, or Harvard. The only exception to this is for CTA verifications, in which case you would change both lines to be your company. All right, please make sure to fill out, I know we mentioned this earlier, but please make sure to fill out all the entirety of the miscellaneous payment non-employee claim form. Uh, the information that we gather on that helps us ensure that the expenses are within compliance within our accountable plan and therefore non-taxable. So we uh, there's some questions in there like the personal time. We need to confirm that personal time was not taken. And if personal time was taken, then we need to make sure all the policy with that is followed. So please make sure to fill out the form thoroughly. And then lastly, for me on this slide, field advancer, travel advance. Uh, I know they used to not be in the same place before, but uh, now they are. If you want a per diem advance, as we call them in Ariba, please do not submit a request for a field advance. Submit a uh, business travel reimbursement spend authorization using the travel advance expense item. We now think of per diem advances as travel advances, but it's the same thing and the process is mostly the same, give or take some tweaks. But if you want a per diem advance, please do not use field advance. Thank you. Okay, We're, there's more best practices. So again, on continuing on, travel status, meal per diem, kind of what I said about the miscellaneous payment form, but also in the ER version, time, um, travel status times determine meal per diem. Um, so if you end at a certain time or start at a certain time, depending on the first and last day of, um, I guess, travel status or when they were working or when they were on the trip will depend. So again, um, that information is on the Travel Services website. 
as well as if you're in the ER module, it is above that for any assist assistance or any additional guidance. So again, please make sure we don't just give full per, <laughs> full per diem every single time. We wanna make sure we check and, and or uncheck what is eligible and ineligible for the traveler. Um, next is going to be lodging overage. So again, um, in the lodging overage, it requires the memo field. Uh, it'll, it won't let you submit or even exit out, I believe, out of that. If the memo field um, is not filled in, that is where you will put the per diem exception. Um, again, we have six available. Um, so like, you know, if you wanna put a conference hotel or ADA or, um, I believe uh, lowest cost overall, that is where you'll put it. And then you just wanna make sure you attach the documentation required for those um, either in the line item itself or within the um, attachments tab. Next, um, yeah, denying and sending back. Um, it kind of related to the first one, Ray, or kind of already went over it, but this is more relating again to your department. Um, again, so if there's, I know a lot of people's inboxes are still exploding with all these types of notifications and people have been um, sending back. So we just want to remind everyone if it's not related to your department or related to your sector in your department and you do not know who this person is, um, please do not touch it. Just please ignore it. I know it's hard, but please ignore it. For example, um, certain things go to uh, the expense data entry specialist first for, I forgot on the, on the top of my mind, which uh, process, but if it does go to them, there are over 14,000, not 14,000, 1,400 people, still a large amount of people, this single um, expense report go, I think it was an expense report. Uh, goes to. So 1,400 people have the option to, to die and send back. And we really want to make sure only those who are relevant to that, for example, expense report should be approving or denying or sending back. So just please make sure we only um, approve, deny, send back. That is the items that are relevant to your department. Next is a uh, pretty custom. Um, I guess it's like big, big intro for Pretty M Custom. This was added after Go Live. Um, this Pretty M Custom expense line is not used for uh, lodging overages. Um, there are two options to use this Pretty M Custom. It'll be um, in its own separate line item. You can either use it to reimburse Per Diem prior to October 2022 or if you wanted to reimburse the traveler less than per diem. So if everyone is available or uh, remembers Arriva, at the bottom of certain expense uh, items, there was an override field. This is what the per diem custom field is for now in Workday. So just linking those two up. Next is uh, going to be, do not use links or comments for expenses that need uh, attached documentation. So we said in Ariba as well, please do not use links. They expire over time or they change over time. For comments, we really uh, do not, <laughs> I understand you wanted to explain why uh, for a certain per diem exception, but again, we need actual physical screenshots, documentation, emails, and um, et cetera for, um, audit. So again, please make sure we use actual documentation and not links or comments. Um, next thing is going to be review requests. Um, right now, it's not too big of an issue. Um, we did um, hire an additional help. But again, um, if there are any rush requests, um, we really want to make sure everyone has a um, basically a fair chance of getting approved. So we don't want to rush 20 of someone's department over these other people who are next in line. So again, 
um, there are one-time courtesies that we give. Um, lastly is Zelle payments. Um, this was mentioned during a procurement office hours, but um, just to repeat, um, Zelle payments are not eligible um, for, uh, I believe, uh, employees and non-employees um, other than um, research, subject, research subjects and ICA travel. So again, only those two types of users or travelers is eligible for cell payments. Okay. So um, there has been a lot of talk about wire payments. I'm gonna make this clear for everyone right now. Um, the travel services office is not the place to ask for wire payments, unfortunately. We're most likely going to direct you guys to the wires or accounts payable um, or uh, banking and accounting for assistance. Again, what you see in the next two slides is from the wires team. Um, so if you have any questions, please reach out to them. Um, if not, we're just going to redirect your ticket to them for further assistance. But um, they were nice enough to write up some quick tips and tricks when it comes to uh, wire payments. So I'll just quickly review those. But if you do have any questions about wire payments, we will take them and um, ask uh, wires or AP to help uh, answer those. Okay, so really quick, uh, what workday flags uh, with red asterisks is a hard requirement. So a lot of people are asking what is required, what is not required. Um, those fields must have something in them. We want to make sure that is the correct piece of information in the correct format. Also note that the format um, of what the information is going into the field may vary country to country. So uh, making sure you do a little bit of research. Um, next, we want to make sure that um, the account that is being used is able to accept wires or the bank is able to accept wires. We wanna make sure to verify that the wire account is valid. Um, as it says on the screen, a quick Google search can tell if a Swift code is misspelled or invalid. If no search results pop up, it's a good sign that it's not a valid Swift code and must be re-verified re by the payee. Um, another thing to mention is special characters. So um, there's a lot of special characters regarding like and, as it says on the screen, um, accents to names. Um, you want to make sure um, they're spelled out. If not, just use a regular letter or like, I guess, the normal uh, alphabet that we use here in the States. It does mention certain apostrophes are okay, but again, uh, the wire or banking information for workday can be a little finicky. It's except some apostrophes, but not all. And uh, there's some more. So more about no special characters. Um, continue. So periods and commas are okay. Uh, substitute to the best of your ability standard characters. So this is the alphabet. Um, and there's more mentioned about like accents or um, characters on top of letters. Um, the last three are gonna be making sure we select the correct country uh, where the bank account is located. Always put the SWIFT in the bank identification code field by default. If there is a red asterisk uh, next to bank code, put the SWIFT code or SWIFT. Yes, yeah, so we we'll put there instead. I bands within workday are considered not as important as before, but if you have it available, please put it into the appropriate field. But that is a short summary on wire payments. Um, again, if you have questions about it, we are free to take them and we will um, give them <laughs> into AV and wires to uh, answer them and we'll send it back to you guys. Okay, on to some questions that we got sent in before the meeting today. Figured we could answer them live here on the air. 
So question one, when a hotel folio includes parking and other fees like internet, what is the best practice? The best practice is uh, to itemize it in the lodging expense item with the right expense item. It's okay to make it its own, but it's easier to review and more cohesive if done in the expense line. But either way, either way works. How do I input daily different different daily rates for my lodging receipt? We have a guide in our FAQ uh, section. I'll, I have a link to it here in my notes so you could find it. Uh, essentially, scroll to the bottom of the workday expense section, and we have a FAQ called How Do I Input Different Daily Rates from My Lodging Receipt? But uh, the short of it is essentially that uh, you can either have different room rate expense items in the itemization section of the lodging uh of the lodging expense item and have one be for one night and a certain rate and then the other be for another night and a certain rate and so forth depending on how many changes you have additionally uh you can also separate them out completely have completely different expense items all together one for you know one rate and then another for another i saw one just like that earlier and uh Question three, do we still have to reimburse via wire instead of via check for travel reimbursements outside of the U.S.? So I will say for employee reimbursements, you cannot do wire. They don't. They do not have that as an option. So for employee reimbursements, we just have direct deposit and check. But if doing a non-employee travel reimbursement through the miscellaneous payments module, you can do check. But there's some risk to that as if their home or bank is based outside of the US, a check may come uh, late or might get lost. More often than not, it gets lost or it takes forever to arrive, which, you know, that even happens when mailing it domestically. But then even if it does arrive, there's also the chance that the bank may not take it. As a, a lot of foreign banks tend to have issues with US checks so to save on all that hassle, we recommend just doing a wire. And number four, if it's only a travel reimbursement and not an honorarium or payment for other services, is it correct that the payee is categorized as a claimant rather than a foreign national payee and that tax info is not required? So <clears throat> please, essentially, here's a quick guide on that. So please use foreign national payee if they are a foreign national domestic payee, if they're a citizen or resident. And to be honest with you, claimant is not exactly applicable, but uh, and uh, if it is for travel reimbursement within policy, tax info is not required. We are not quite sure what claimant is was made for, but essentially if uh, they are a foreign national, we want that uh, stated on there, it helps with uh, checking compliance and so forth but no if they are if it is a travel reimbursement you're using our expense item you're attaching our form you do not need to provide tax information all right okay sorry about that okay so another thing um, we're coming back around to PayPal Venmo Zelle mobile apps. Um, so um, these are not uh, reimbursable expenses. I recall um, that at least PayPal Venmo have been cleared as okay sources of payment for receipts as long as they are detailed receipts and just paid for those services is correct. What about Apple, Google Pay, and similar payment services? So, um, Again, if a reimbursement comes back to us, for example, an Uber, and they are paid by one of these payment services and it just says that, we're going to send it back and ask for additional documentation if, if it's possible from the traveler. Um, it needs to signify and come that the charge was from their actual bank account or um, their credit card transaction. And if 
uh, once that additional documentation is attached, then it is good to go. Because we actually, um, not just us, but uh, in an audit situation, there needs to be a clear uh, trail and seeing that bank and or credit card transaction um, show um, gives the okay if uh, you want to use PayPal, Venmo, or Zelle. But if you just give us documentation that just says it's paid by Cash App and no bank account, no Visa, MasterCard, or credit card transaction that shows it, then it's not reimbursable. Okay, next is going to be, can you clarify, please clarify what my wallet funds is referring to? Does this include credits on Ubers or Lyft accounts, for example, refunded services, if they can provide proof of original payment that is issued, the credit or refund is uh, that then reimbursable as payment method towards their expense. So my wallet funds is going to be, um, it can be a range of things. So it can be uh, a credit from a canceled flight um, or a credit um, from a canceled Uber per se. Um, those kind of things we did give a situation on the website if, or an answer per se, if that happens and it is from a canceled expense, um, we would need the original itinerary if it was air for, airfare or the original receipt if it was an Uber to show um, that the traveler actually paid for those um, and not from a credit. That's why we require that for any sort of uh, payment by um, airfare credit, for example. If the traveler loaded money onto um, their Alaska wallet funds, for example, they would need to show the bank transaction of when it was loaded. So again, to see a clear audit trail. So we wanna always see the bank transaction or credit card transaction to so show a clear audit trail in order for the traveler to be reimbursed, um, especially if it's canceled. And then lastly, uh, one of our PIs want to be reimbursed for his travel and asked to apply his expenses between three budgets. Um, a lot of people, and I see it also in the questions, like when can we split it? Can we split it now? And unfortunately it is still no for the ER module. Um, I believe you can, you can technically kind of split it in the miscellaneous payment by adding lines, but for the ER, module, they don't allow uh, split um, work tags per se. Um, again, what we recommend, um, I know it's not the best, but it that is, we, we are standing by this, is that you put one work tag in and then creating a journal voucher or JV out, uh, JV after the fact. I know it's not the best and it creates additional work, but that is what we, um, conversed with with FT as the best possible solution at this current time. And we can definitely bring it back up with them and see if there's any other options. But again, this is the only option we have at this time. Oh, okay. And then a couple more. So uh, an employee paid on behalf of our group while traveling and is asking reimbursement for their lodging. Since Workday does not allow us to enter more than one lodging reimbursement under the same ER as it considers it a duplicate, may we use per diem custom? So first, again, per diem custom is not used, um, one, for overages, but also for splitting um, lodging. So again, if let's say someone like this um, did uh, pay for someone's room in an Airbnb or their portion, you can just put it all together into the same line item and most likely it will cause an overage, unfortunately. But um, when you put the overage expense item into the itemization under daily expenses, uh, in the memo field, usually you would put, again, a per diem exception. But instead of uh, that, you can go ahead and put a claimant, like the word claimant, and say how many people are being claimed, including the traveler. And then obviously you could just do mental math and divide accordingly uh, for the room rate. So again, we will not be using per diem custom um, to reimburse or to split, I guess, lodging in that sense. 
Next question. I'm trying to do a travel reimbursement and want to reimburse the flight Wi-Fi. Under which spend category will I need to select? I selected internet service, but it didn't work out. And it says the business purpose doesn't match. So again, um, I know a lot of us, like including myself, like to automatically write in or automatically type the expense item that we're looking for into the field. Um, please again, uh, we recommend to guarantee that it's always the correct uh, business purpose expense item is to always uh, go by expense item group, business travel, if it's business travel, business travel call in whatever it is for this one, it will be miscellaneous travel and then you can choose internet fees. And then um, there should be no error after that. So again, that's to guarantee. I know a lot of us are including myself like to type in. Um, there's also, uh, related actions button, once you click any of them, if you on the side, so like I click this internet fee and then it's in there now and you click the related action button, which is again, a little Twinkie brick, whatever you'd like to call it, it'll show what business purpose it's matching to. Okay. Non-travel, CTA, field advance, or um, business travel. So, but again, um, that's the way to guarantee you're in or you select the correct expense item. Okay, so we have reached the end of our slideshow and we will do Q&A um, to the best of our abilities. Um, but yeah. Okay, so we'll start from the top, all these questions, and then work our way down. But if we don't get to yours, because I see there's a lot of questions in in our defense, Sam and I are but two people, uh, we will fill them out after the fact and send them out. So for Lan Yu and Patrick Kibbs' question on reconciling advances, and I believe some other people asked a similar question. We are still working on determining the back end process of advances. However, you guys can begin to work on the reconciliation yourselves and submit it. Essentially, if you remember how to reconcile an advance in Ariba, it's pretty much the same process. What you will do is you will create an expense report, you will tie it to a uh, the spend authorization with the catch advance. And then you can begin to apply different per diem, apply the per diems that you used, that you requested, and Workday will automatically reduce it. You don't have to add. The only difference here is you don't, besides tying it to a spend authorization, is you don't have to add the per diem advance uh, reconciled, or I don't remember what it's called, received ex uh, expense item. Uh, we are working on guides, so we will hopefully have something out soon to help you do this. And then we might just have to learn as we go on the back end of that. But for the meantime, I understand that these, these things do have to be reconciled and we understand that. And as well, people have other expenses like Patrick Gibbs mentions that need to be paid out. So yes, please go ahead and start processing your reconciliations if you would like. We're also more than happy to jump on calls with you and help walk you through it. Uh, that is what we're here for. Or if you the screenshot does you well, that's fine. But uh, essentially, we don't have uh, we don't have proxy access. Otherwise, we would have tested it out in the systems that we in the testing systems that we have for Workday. But we're just gonna have to uh, learn this way. But yes, to recap again for these two questions. Please start working on reconciling your advances by creating an ER, tying it to the spend authorization with the cash advance, and adding expenses. And any other questions you have on that, you can send them our way, or we can always hop on, hop on a call. Okay, Dan asks, the Concur guest air travel option um has been turned off as i mentioned earlier uh, in march i'll need to submit approximately 50 flights for students over two days will the travel agent be able to do that also instead of 
nine pride um nine dollars it is going to be 33 per agent which would cost us an additional a thousand for the same travel we do hear you dan um again we are in talks and we will definitely take your feedback into consideration um the travel agent is uh, we have confirmed with cbt they have been hiring so um if you need any assistance with customer service but um, they should be able to help you guys uh, create itineraries for your 50 students or 50 flights uh ellie Hallman asks confirming no change in how we handle cta charges but will be fixed uh, i think that was i think all of these are related to Jesse's section. There should be no changes. Are you going to say something? Uh, no, no, I just wanted to confirm, Ellie, if that was what you meant. If not, the current CTA pro process is still the same. Um, I believe there was an email when we did the demo. Um, I don't know how long ago, um, but it's still the current process. I think Jessica also has a similar question. Will the system pick up different dates of ex of each expense than versus uh, one date for all expense lines? I believe, yes, they are doing it per line. So if you put one date as August 4th and another date August 5th, it'll that'll be the actual accounting date. Let me see a couple more for Jesse. Okay, we can we can leave the questions regarding Jesse's section for Jesse, so we don't, uh, you know, we're not experts in that field. Uh, looks like the next question question, be Michael Chase's miscellaneous form includes link to GSA per diem rates, but that is only for domestic travel. International travel is using Department of Defense per diem. All right, let me double check that real quick. Does it link to? I think we might just want to change that to be our determining per diem page if it's not already. Just a second. Yeah, if the if the link is weird, we will update that for you guys. But again, GSA is just domestic. International is the Department of Defense, which actually has both domestic and international. Um, the Department of Defense takes the domestic from the GSA and then the international from the Department of State. So yeah, it's a little confusing. It's a, but, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, we'll update that link to be um, the our, our page where it has both of them. But yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Ellie asks, will there be any updates to either the former work day to align language, for example, start and end date, I believe is arrive and departure date, and these seem to counter previous language. The one on work day, um, I believe, uh, as this has been requested uh, several times by other departments and also us to just be more clear, but um, I don't want to use the word limitation, but there is a limitation for at least on workday. Um, I know that's confusing. If you if you guys are open for us to align it to workday, we are open to do that on the form. But the workday itself, um, after confirming and asking several times with our FT partners, they are not able to change the wording on the actual workday site itself. But if you'd like us to change the start and end times on the form, please let us know in the chat or Q&A. Um, all 
Okay. Next, Next question. question. Skagen yeah. says, we have a consultant who is claiming travel expenses and consulting fee. Shall I process the payment via MP or okay. SI? So, uh, sorry, Sam, I'm hearing an echo. Oh, thank you. So, um, so essentially that depends. Consultants are kind of in a weird space. If they want both of it together, it would be best done as an SI. I think it also depends on the, your contract with this consultant, because if uh, if they don't mind just having it reimbursed like a normal non-employee, then and that's fine with the contract, then they can just do an MP, but we would not be able to do the, or maybe we can, let's see, do we have, do they do consulting fees in the? There's a consulting spend category in the MP, so I believe then yes, you could do a non-employee travel spend category for the travel portion, and then the taxable the fee would have to be taxable, I believe. So that would go on to the spend category for taxability of consultants. Okay. Renacia. Oh my god, I'm gonna say incorrect this time. <laughs> Uh, we would like some guidance and or help on wire payments and workday. Um, I can definitely connect you with um, wires team, the wires team AP, or um, possibly even PCS um, on that. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the knowledge base to do that one-on-one, um, -on -one, but I can definitely connect you with them. Um, we can also, if possible, um, link you to the website as well. But again, um, if you need us to connect you with them, um, just uh, feel free to email us. Mom asks, what expense item do we use for pet fee? We use resort fees for ER 234A4. I think it was pulled from the spend category and the guide said we shouldn't select the spend category group. Pet fee being for a pet they brought along. I'm going to err on the side of that being a personal expense and not reimbursable, much like a, a child care expense would be non-reimbursable. So um, ideally, please don't use any expense item for it. Okay, Stephanie asks, if a foreign national traveler was already in the U.S. and only traveled within the U.S., such as an international student, do we need the I-94 and passport documents to be submitted into DocuSign? No, you do not. So this is only for uh, travel mm -hmm. that the traveler has to leave the U.S. or enter the U.S. But if they're just going from, for example, Washington State to New York City, then no need to do the I-94 passport documents. Carrie Goodman asks, when non-fiscal staff fill out this form, they sometimes get details wrong. Meal per diem rates, eligibility times, for example. Do we need to redo the form so it matches the ER exactly, or can we simply notate the correct details on the PDF rather than filling out an entirely new form. Okay, so I assume you did not mean ER and meant MP. So ideally, we you don't need to fill out the form completely so long as you notate the correct details on the PDF form and reattach it, some name differently, like updated form or something. I see that's how I see people do it, and I like that that works. And so long as that matches what is being reimbursed, then we have no issue. Nina asks, does a separate form need to be completed if the staff member is traveling to several countries? No, it does not. Um, if you're able to fit it into that single form, that's perfectly fine. We just want to make sure that it's clear that this uh, I don't know, expenses are to the UK and this other expenses is to Italy and not just for us on the approver side to guess. We'll, we'll most likely send back for clarification. So if you're able to fit in there and be clear about what is which country for the expenses, you're perfectly fine to go. All 
All right, Ellie Hammond's question from 1022 a.m. Also, the form collects when the per diem is being requested. However, Workday asks for when per diem is not being claimed. That is an interesting observation, and uh, I think we shall take that into consideration when we determine other ways to streamline our processes. Thank you. Maddie asks, can the 4.0 version include other mileage rates, aka the IRS medical rates? For now, we're just putting mileage in the other investigation. And we also do see that from RN. Um, if you do have the capabilities on your Adobe Acrobat, you can actually uh, edit the mileage on there. We do have a couple of other school of medicine, I believe. Um, someone within that um, area uh, edit the field to their um, rate, which is 0 0.3055, and that um, automatically calculates for them. So if you have the ability on your Acrobat to do that, you're free to do so. Um, but we have not considered adding other mileage rates at this current time. Renizia Jackson asks, can you review the per diem website to determine breakfast, lunch, and dinner per diem with incidentals? It seems Workday separates those meals differently. So, okay. So we consider meal per diem. When we say meal per diem, we're thinking of meals and incidentals per diem. This per diem already includes the amount added for incidentals and it's just split three ways for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, so this is how the state has us break it down as we take the daily rate calculated by adding the local meals plus the local incidentals and dividing it by 24, 25, and 48, or 26. Uh, it's 24% breakfast, 28% lunch, and 48% yeah. dinner. Thank you, Sam. I always, they changed those up recently, so. I just have a hard time remembering that. But um, Workday does it the same way that the website considers it. If you have a little bit more details on what you mean by Workday separating those meals differently, that would be great if you could let us know. Thank you. Okay. Gary Morris asks, on the form, do we have to type in the uh, cash symbol or can we input them out? That is 19 instead of 19 with the cash symbol. Helps when entering a lot of numbers to not include the cash symbol. You should be able to not have to put the cash symbol. You should just put the number in and it should be able to um, automate and calculate. Um, so again, um, the cash symbol should not be required to be inputted. Yes, the cash symbol can get quite annoying so don't blame me there heather hudson asks how do we have international travelers securely submit their passport in 994 and then lauren commented saying that docusign was used and heather asks is there a secure way to submit it with within workday so on that i'm gonna type an answer for you essentially and this is this is uh the docusign linked on our form in the I think it says DocuSign. It should be towards the top under if you under the visa under where you enter the visa type status it is a link that says procurement DocuSign. That is our link to our DocuSign portal. There is not a secure way to submit these documents through Workday, so we ask that you use our DocuSign portal, reference the MP number, and then we can sign in, download them, and make sure everything's good to go. And no one's privacy is violated, which brings us excellently to the next question. Okay, Jacqueline asks, can you please tell more about the EU GDPR privacy notice? So that's, uh, again, uh, regarding EU members. So anyone in the European Union, they do have quite uh, strict restrictions regarding uh, privacy and sensitive documentation. Um, again, that is linked on the NEF form, as, like we, as what we like to call for short. Um, that is for the department to make sure that the traveler acknowledges 
what we do with the information and that we also keep it uh, securely and it's not like exploited or anything like that, but that's what the privacy notice is for. Um, we are working with the privacy office here at UW to update that as well. Um, I believe we were linking the Ariba one. Uh, we'll do a couple of changes there and it will be actually uh, possibly updated to a just a general uh, pay privacy notice in the future, but right now, since we're still in progress, it's just EU. But again, please make sure any EU members should be sent that link to acknowledge of how UW uses or uh, has their um, sensitive documentation. Raquel says the form rounds up to a penny. Do we have to match the amount on the form to the actual total amounts on the receipts? For example, my calculated amount is 199, but the form rounded it to a penny. Wouldn't that be a dollar? To are you saying, Raquel, that it rounded to 200? You can say in the chat. Because that's something we can look at. We can change the rounding. Ideally, we want it to just be actual amounts on the receipts. I think within a penny rounded to 200. Yeah, that's uh we'll take a look at that. That's not ideal. We don't want it rounding up a dollar. So, please just enter the amount for receipts on the M on the on the MP and uh, we'll go ahead and find a way to change the rounding on the form. Thanks for bringing that up to us. Lauren asks, why can we split FDM on ERs that aren't related to travel, but we can't split FDM on travel ERs? I'm not sure which business process you have are able to, because I know like a different process, like um, pro card verification, you can split. But from what I've seen between at least the CTA ERs, we've um, messed around with and looked into and tested and the current business travel ones and non-travel, they weren't able to split. So if you have an example and you want to send it to us to sh see how it was split for that type of ER, please email us and um, we can try to work with you on that. Dennis Fang says, asks, what should we do if we are submitting lodging expenses and meal expenses for fiscal year 24? I believe the workday is still using fiscal year 23 per diem rates. Is there a workaround or do we have to wait until fiscal year 24 to submit the reimbursements? Thank you. And uh, I'll note he received one like for that. Went very well. Uh, so we are in the process of loading these uh, loading rates in workday. It's kind of a completely different beast and um, then in Ariba, it's a lot more finicky. So it's taking us a lot more time. We are also speaking with the integrations team to get an actual integration done where it'll just happen automatically. And we just cannot wait for that day, I'll say. Uh, but for now, since uh, I don't have an estimate, it should be soon within a week or so for us to update the rates. but. For now, for the very immediate future, you could use the per diem custom expense item and just reference the future rate. We can look up on the GSA because we have the rates. We just, it's just loading them. That's the issue. So if you add in the memo of the per diem custom expense item that you are claiming fiscal year 24 rates and enter it as um, putting the per diem rate in the per unit amount box and the number of nights in the quantity box, then shouldn't be an issue just make sure you attach all receipts and don't exceed per diem it's kind of going to be manual for the lodging so please be mindful of that and uh those will come for our review okay Danielle asks can an example of the 75 percent rule be shown so um basically instead of giving or like selecting on workday right now based on the time 
they have. Um, is that for Seattle? Oh, yeah. Okay, so for example, if someone comes to Seattle, so when so dates, basically it's going to be 75% regardless of what meals and what time they entered um, out of this for the 75% rule. For example, uh, Seattle's per diem for meals is 79 and it'll just give the traveler 59.25 um, the first and last day without regard, again, to the time. It'll just give that amount. And um, I guess in a sense, as Renee men er mentioned earlier, there's no really like thinking and manual process and Workday will automatically calculate that for you guys. Janie says current method matches actuals, perhaps offer international versus domestic rates to encompass costs. Uh, so we do have that, but I, I have a feeling you're referring to our per diem times topic. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit in the chat what you are asking, Janie? Okay, Janie, we can follow up later. Uh, we got to keep him moving, get to these 60, 59 questions. Um, Sue asks, it would be really helpful if a custom amount field could be added for per diem, for meal per diem, so we could claim some amount the travel actually spent that it's that is less than the allowable per diem. Right now, we have to click some boxes in the meal days and leave someone clicked trying to come as close to the custom amount as possible and shared environment continually sends these back because they can't figure out why we are claiming or yeah why we are claiming or not certain meals when we've stated that none were provided a custom amount box as there wasn't really help any possibility of this uh, ever being added and katie responded that um, the custom or the pure dm custom expense item is used for that um you just want to make a note that it was meals per diem. And then there are a couple other questions. Um, but again, uh, yes, Sue, it is available per diem custom. That'll be your best friend. Some people will put um, whatever the department is um, going to reimburse. That is less than per diem. Some people or some departments like to put uh, what the traveler actually bought via their receipt. And they can put in the memo meal per diem based on receipt. That is also something we commonly see now for this uh, line item or expense item. All right, Karen Crow asks about an example of a fraudulent booking and reimbursement through UW system. Uh, okay, so no fraudulent reimbursements unless some of the ones that we saw were fraudulent, but uh, we wouldn't have a way of checking that. Fraudulent bookings, I do recall a time that someone booked with our our manager's name right on uh was it on the cta or did they just do it i think they booked so they used her name they called them and they said they're Teresa athen and that they want to book a ticket and they booked a the ticket and they went through we even get this with our other travel vendors as well once i got a call from a call in an email from one of our other travel vendors asking that saying that I had inquired about travel for the holidays and I had not because uh, I didn't have time or money for travel to on the holidays unfortunately but yeah it had definitely not been me and some vendors have different levels of security and some you know some have less and in that in those cases it goes through and we do not want that happening He asks, when will the expense report update the review process so it shows the approval flow? Also, is there a simple process to delete an expense report that we created but will not submit? Thanks. So to answer your first question, we have um, not heard any updates. Um, not a lot of people have been asking this question, so we can definitely bring it up to our FD partners if there's a possibility of enhancing it in the future to see the full approval flow like Ariba. Um, but I, again, as of currently, there is no upcoming um, change. 
For the second question, is it simple to, or is there a process to delete? So unfortunately, Workday does not delete ERs, unlike Ariba, we can only cancel. Um, you can definitely do that if it's uh, an ER you made for yourself, you'll just go through the expenses app, view or edit the ER uh, that you created for yourself. And then um, again, that lovely related actions icon, the Twinkie brick, you'll click that expense report cancel. Um, if it's not for you and it's someone else, as I believe Renee mentioned earlier, the R1126 um, expense report search, you'll go through there. And then again, if you go next to the ER number, the brick will pop up, you'll click it, expense report, cancel. Um, it does not delete it from the system, it'll forever be <laughs> in the system. But when you look up that ER, it'll now say ER number cancel. But again, that is the current process and we have not also heard any enhancement or anything like that to delete it from the system. Andrea de la Paz says, could you please circle back and clarify the survey question? It is a bit unclear. So for the survey question, essentially, we just wanted to gauge how you guys feel about uh, adopting the 75% rule, like Sam mentioned, where you would get 75% of a day's meal per diem on the first and last days, regardless of what time you enter. Um. The question is just if you have if you want or you know if you want to or not i think we we will send out an updated version of this of the survey because i see a lot of conflicting things here and then the survey was a little too close and i don't know we'll see essentially we are just kicking around other ideas that uh we may be able to which will help us to bring things under compliance that we have gotten from our other uh, peers at other organizations that handled similar transitions. It seems that uh, either it is done manually through either the way we do it or the way other people do it, where you just start off at zero or they just abandon it like Ohio State and uh, I think some other university. But, you know, this is just one option and, you know, Things are always changing, but uh, essentially the question is just what we feel if we would support, uh, the question is just if we would support adopting this new policy. It looks like another question from Andrea about splitting FDMs. I kind of answered that earlier. Again, we cannot split, at least on business travel, non-travel and CTA. I have not tested field advance we cannot split um, at this current time. And as recommended, it's create HAV after the fact. Jason says there is no reconciliation for advances. I have travelers returning and need to complete this. What can we do going forward? So if, uh, if you're still on Jason, I don't know if you saw my answer to uh, the first question that was kind of similar to yours. Uh, just go ahead and uh, Put it through like a, just make an expense report, tie it to the spend authorization that you issued the cash advance on, and then begin adding the expenses, specifically the per diem and workday will begin to reconcile the advance. If you would like further assistance with this, Jason, just shoot me an email and we can go over it. We are still ironing out the fine details of this process. So we don't have the process documented as well. There's, you know, things about documentation on our end, uh, but we'll put something, we're hoping to get something put together very soon. And once that does happen, we will let you all know and send it on our listserv as well as attach it to our website or whichever best way we could do it. But yes, Jason, in the meantime, just shoot us an email. I'd be happy to hop on a call with you and we can go over it. And the same goes for anyone in this call. I'll help any of you. Okay, Danielle asks, are spent authorizations the only forms that should be filled out or do you need, or do you still want the pre-authorization forms to be added or are the spend 
uh, are the pre-authorization travel forms taking over the spend authorizations? Um, I could have sworn in the August um, during the procurement pro process workshop that due to enhanced monitoring and the bugs with spend authorization workday, we shouldn't be using those right now and just stick with the old pre-authorization travel form. Okay, so this little little mini talk about spend authorizations. Again, this is an optional process. You, it doesn't have to be the only process you do for pre-trip approval, et cetera. Um, what we've recommended um, is many options. Obviously, you can, you can do it if your department would like to do that way, but you can also do a pre-trip approval form outside of Workday and attach it to the spend authorization for pre-encumbrance. Um, again, there's those two options. Uh, we've had people use spend authorizations, not many, as you can, as you stated, because of the bugs and such. We haven't had any issues from our end for travel spend authorizations or travel advances, other than like maybe editing certain fields to make sure it's within the compliance. But for at least for travel, we haven't again had any issues, and you guys are free to submit spend authorizations at this current time. Um, if you do see any bugs, please let us know, and we will work with um, FT or the Workday inter Integration team um, on fixing them. But again, um, you can go ahead and use a spend authorization, but they are also optional in this whole pre-trip approval process. Maddie Ivanova says, how can we see the approval flow for a travel reimbursement request? It says the status is in progress for several weeks now, and it is not clear when it will actually be reviewed. And two people said, or Stephanie in the chat says, uh, go to the process tab. It should show who it's currently sitting with. And Maddie says she doesn't see a process tab on the screen when she goes. So essentially, I think what Stephanie was trying to say is if you are in the actual ER, so you're looking at your you're in the review or view ER page. In there, there's a tab called business process. Here, I'm gonna sign in real quick. There's a tab called business process, which should show you where it is in the process. It won't probably won't show you where it will be, but it'll show you where it is and who it's waiting on. And let's... uh. Real quick. Oh, yeah. I'll share my screen. Real quick, this one submitted 58 seconds ago. So if you're on the view expense report page, if you click business process, this tab right here, It'll show you everything that's happened. It'll show you submitting the expense report, you making the questionnaire or whoever, you know, whoever submits it. And then it'll show the shared environment expense specialist. And then it'll show the grant manager approving and adding approvers, as you can see here, and the added approvers approving. And then all ignore all the stuff that says status not required. Workday just goes through this business process and sees what approval is required and it applies it. And if not, it skips it. As you can see, this one that is in my queue is currently waiting on approval by expense partner. And these are all the people with the expense partner role. And if there's more than enough people that fit on here, you can click on this number right here and it'll show you. And you can get a nice list of them. And if you click on them, you can see their email like so. It'll bring you to their profile. You can click email and you can access that. It won't show you this information and uh, please don't use my employee ID for any malice. Okay. Thank you for your question.
my bad, I'm muted, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, good to answer your question about meal per diem. I know we've been going back and forth about it. Um, thank you for giving the situation. Um, so it looks like the personal time is at the end of the trip. So technically once uh, on the 6th, once the tr traveler, since if they're staying in the same, oh God, if they're going to San Sacramento, once they leave their uh, Reno hotel to start their personal time, that's the end of the uh, meal per diem or travel status. And then it will restart again, technically, if when um, the traveler leaves their Sacramento hotel, their personal time hotel, to go back home home. That's And when they arrive back home, that is the official another end of travel status. So it's kind of a little funky. Some departments just like, kind of ignore the last part because they don't want to give that per se which is perfectly fine and they just end it white when travel stop i mean when personal time begins but when the traveler leaves their reno hotel ending their business utah business time to go to the airport to go to sacramento that is going to be the end of meal per diem it'll restart again when the traveler leaves their sacramento hotel to just go back home and then it'll end again when the traveler arrives home so again, just the we're trying to chunk out that personal time as no meal per diem because there's no travel status. I hope that answers your question. If not, again, reach out to me and we'll work one on one on this. Okay, Chad says, "Is there a day when we will stop receiving workday notifications for people outside of our team?" How is this how is this system not able to filter down to team level? And I'll add he got four likes on that and uh some people have some comments which I will now read to you. I was told this is a workday issue specifically because Edub has such a large network the design of the system isn't able to trickle down so specifically. And Stephanie says it's also how the security roles are assigned they aren't assigned at the department level. And I'll add he got he just got another like. So shout out to whoever added that like. So to answer this question, possibly. Oh, it's now this he's got more likes now. All right. So to answer this question, possibly there is a day. I can't quite say. Uh but the reason that this is oh my god, this is it's exploding now. Wow, Chad, you're doing great with your question. <laughs> but the reason that this is uh this way and exactly like the people in the comments point out is that these security roles are assigned at certain levels. Like for example, I assume you're talking about the CTA stuff or the CTA verification stuff or the pro card verification stuff. The reason that you are all on that, even though all these people are not on your team is because the CTA verification is asking for an approval from an expense data entry specialist, which was a, uh, I don't know why they added that, but I heard it was a campus, it was a request from certain campus stakeholders. That is the answer I was given. But the only option that they had to add to this role besides the cost center manager, which was already on there to get an extra eye, extra set of eyes is to add the expense that entry specialist, I guess. That's what I heard. That um, So, and the expense that entry specialist is tied at the company level. So unless they figure out a different way to go about approvals or they find a way to tie expense to entry specialists to more lower levels of cost centers or work tags, it'll probably be the same thing. I don't know where they're at with that. I think that I would hope that, you know, something's being done. I assume something's being done, but I don't know the status of it. And then, the, you know, certain times, certain rules are based on the shared environment. For example, UW Medicine, the shared environment expense specialist is a, is a UW Medicine position where essentially UW Medicine has one shared environment for all of UW Medicine. And UW Medicine is a very large team. So uh, I know a lot of us campus people, we all have our own shared environments, but um, yeah, not UW Medicine. So that is 
kind of just my statement on the matter. And way to go, Chad. You're at 16. Then it went down to 15, and then they decided to like it again. Oh, no, it's at Way to go, Chad, on your very viral comment. Okay, Marcy asks, it's really frustrating to not be able to save a draft when there is an error, when I've entered a ton of info, but there's an error and I can't figure out or need the time to figure out. Workday won't let me save the draft. So I have to do the whole thing over. Is there a way to allow a, allow a save draft even when there is an error? I guess it depends on what the error is because I believe I've personally been able to save um, if there was an error or I kind of emptied that single field that I was trying to fill in that caused the error and was able to save after that. Um, we have not brought this up with um, our FT team about this, but if you can show us the error that it's causing, Marcy, I know it's additional task for you to do. Um, we can bring it up and see what we can do um, regarding saving, even though you're in the middle of something. Uh, Sharon Risley asks, my, or says, uh, slash asks, my coworker and myself both do ERs, but are not able to see each other's ERs if we need to cover for the other, if they're out of the office and a question comes up, we are both in the same department, can we get this changed? And there's some comments, Donna says, you have to do the find expense report for worker and put your coworker's name, the created by worker. Or for MP, oh yeah, that's actually a, that's a very good answer. That is a way to do it. And uh, I think you should be able to edit it. If not, I believe you can copy it. Essentially, you just click on the Twinkie on, by doing the report that Donna says here. If you click on the Twinkie on the actual expense report, then it should give you an option to either edit or cancel or copy if, uh, if you don't get one, then you can use the other, you know, kind of thing. Good question, though. Susan is in competition with Chad with the likes, but not there. Um, for future meetings, it would be great if you could spell out acronyms on your slides. That is good feedback. Um, I know there's a couple things like ICA, SWIFT, um, on there, we will definitely edit that after this uh, meeting presentation and get that out to you guys, but we will, that is noted for the future. Can you, Renicia Jackson would like examples of when attached documentation rather than links are required. So essentially, uh, I would, I would say, I would hazard to say that Attached documentation is always required. Personally, if I see documentation is provided through a link, uh, I send it back and ask for it to be attached. Links tend to change and break, especially later down the line, an auditor may come by and try to click on the link and the website's long gone or the link has changed. I know websites change their linking structure all the time, so please don't document with links. Please document with documents. And because Chemi's next question is really quick, I'll take that too. Hopefully Sam doesn't mind. Chemi wants to know, what is ICA travel? And ICA travel is intercollegiate athletics. So the football team, the volleyball team, the sports, the jocks. Okay, Jason mentions that it's too bad about Zell. This created a huge wire problem for us, and Zell was so easy to pay our guests. Will this be an option in the future? Um, I cannot say yes or no, but we can definitely reach out to Banking Accounting to see if they would like to um, put that as a possible enhancement. Um, but yeah, we were kind of also sad about it because we were also like happy to see other options for travelers. But again, we'll reach out to Banking Accounting if they're we we'll like to see it in the future. 
And Rachel Summers has a question along the similar lines. Is there a reason we can't have students be available for Zelle payments, especially if School of Medicine students are traveling throughout the Whammy region? Is there another digital option for payment excluding ACH? And to answer your first question, the reason student the reason ACL payments generally were limited is because they were supposed to be limited to begin with and just be for research subjects and what department was it? An ICA for Zelle payments for all the specific, you know, niche reasons they both have. Um, so it was only ever supposed to be for those, and they did not have it set that way, unfortunately. I, you know, I have my own opinions about that. Uh, but, you know, like Sam mentioned, we can always pass on your suggestions and opinions to the banking team and accounts payable, and hopefully we can get them to reconsider. Uh, as for other digital options for payments besides ACH, the only thing I can say is wire, which I know is not probably what you want to hear. But ACH, I would believe, is easier than wires if ACH works, but essentially ACH is, is all we got. And Ruth Levy mentions, we've been using ACH and it seems to be working okay. So yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, Courtney asks, how do we contact Wire's email? Another process. Um, Donna gave uh, Banking and Accounting's email, which is also an option too. Uh, Wire's is going to be, I believe, apwires at uw.edu. So apwires, uh, seven letters, at uw.edu. Um, I believe also PCS might have some knowledge on that. So you can also reach out to pceshelp at uw.edu. If not, they'll forward your email to AP wires or accounts payable for that. So many different emails, many different options. Um, but for the AP wires team, uh, wire AP wires at uw.edu or banking and accounting at bankrec at uw.edu. Jason Sutherland asks, will we get these slides and will there be a help guide sent out to us? Google searches do not always fit our workflow. We provide the information we need for every country. And he adds, this is about wires. Uh, so I can't speak for help guides. I, I've, I have, I think I did recommend once to them that they should do that, but um, you know, we're not the experts on that. We just kind of, get what they tell us so we cannot create a guide but i think a guide would be a great idea and I, ideally someone will do it but uh i don't know uh so as for these slides we will send out these slides to you so hopefully that helps somewhat okay katie asks these best practices seem to evolve a lot of research on our end. We are not wire experts and we shouldn't be expected to be as well. If we can get a clear guideline as instance for wires, that'd be very helpful. Um, we agree. Um, again, we are on your side. We are also not wire experts and we rely on the wires team or banking and accounting to help us out. Um, we can give the feedback you guys have to them, um, but again, it's not up to us. And unfortunately, since it's not our process, I, in the sense of like the wire payment part, um, but again, we'll give you we'll give the feedback you guys give to us for them, and um, we'll let you know if they will update us with anything or any guides or anything else re um, relying to wires. But for now, um, if you do have wire questions, feel free to put it in here, feedback, and we will give it to the wires team, or you can just email us, um, and we'll forward it to them as well. But I'm really sorry, guys. We don't, we are not wire experts as well. We cannot like give you a, a concrete answer. And on that note, I'm gonna let's see the next two questions are, or I guess three sort of are wire related. So, Jason, uh, yeah, that is a, I understand that is a wrinkle. So, hopefully, we can get some more clarity from our. SMEs sooner rather than later. 
And then Marcy would like to request the wire request form be updated to include the information that Workday needs, like checking versus savings, country, et cetera. So I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that form has been abandoned and is, I don't think they use it, but I'm not too sure. Like Sam said, we, we really have uh, no insight or say in that field, but um Oh, Marcy says the one we send a potential pay is to fill out for us. That is something that you could uh, request the wires team to do, or we could pass it on to the wires team. And I see Sally says it's gone from the website. That is interesting. I, uh, yeah, I would just recommend reaching out to AP wires. Hopefully they have some sort of guide they could provide you or update the form or have the form replaced by something something but uh yeah we will defer wire questions to ap wires uh lynn uh asked can you average different ra hotel rates across states to equal the same amount instead of itemizing um i know some people have been doing it but please do not do that please itemize out the different rates um this will um be easier to match up to obviously the receipt, but also help out regarding into per diem overages. Um, please again, do not average it out. I know you can explain it and that, that is an option, but we really do not encourage that option at all. We really want everyone to itemize the hotel rates. And yes, we understand that causes extra work. Um, but again, um, we're also trying to figure out on our end if how to improve this. Um, if you have any other methods that are not just averaging out these rates, please let us know. But again, um, we want everyone just to put in the actual amount for each rate, room rate, into the itemization portion of the line item. Mary Martha McNally asks, if staff purchase a premium economy airfare, but they pay for the upgrade with a different credit card, do we state economy or premium economy on the airfare status? So that's a good question. I would say you should just state whatever they purchase. So if they fly, what if they purchase and fly? So if they fly premium economy, please put that on there. But if they pay it on, if they don't want it reimbursed, you can add that in uh, a note stating they don't want to get reimbursed for that and we'll send it through if they got it for free with uh airline their status it helps if uh you know if we see their status on there is something that reasonably can merit the upgrade then so long as that is stated as a memo on there we can send it through or with you know um admin approval but yeah, if they fly premium economy, please put premium economy as the status on there. Jason asks if a wire is sent back, does just updating the wire farm allow the settlement run to pick it up or just do we have to create an M a new MP and go through the entire approval flow? Um, again, the wire form isn't really used, it's gonna be based on the banking information for the payee. So technically, if they are a non-single use payee, you can go back into the MP and then next to their name, there should be a lovely brick um, related actions icon Twinkie. And then you could edit the payee's information from there and then resubmit the MP. And, and unfortunately, yes, it will have to go through the approval flow once again for payment. But if it's a single use payee, you're gonna have to make another single use, not single use, another miscellaneous payee and um, make another MP and then et cetera. So um, yeah, unfortunately that's the current process, but um, yeah, we would just recommend going to edit the payee itself before uh, resubmitting. 
Mary Martha McNally asks, for these alternative methods of payment, is there a good explanation of what is allowed on your site for us to send to staff as an update? Uh, so I don't believe we have one. I think we mostly just touch on the direct deposit and check is what is there as for employee travel. That's those are the only options. And remember, we don't we we don't own the miscellaneous payment process. We're just kind of like it. We just kind of live in the guest room, so to speak, of miscellaneous payments, the house of miscellaneous payments. Uh, but we can we can uh, update that to provide a little bit more guidance. But essentially, the only limitation is just. Uh, or actually, I think they have some guidance on the actual miscellaneous payments page on a that on a P's side, and I will go and find that real quick and double check that. Uh, let's see. So payment, it's the old payment to individuals page. Payment types. Let's run through here. Okay, maybe they don't. I could have sworn they did. Hmm. Okay, I will find that and uh, put that in our follow-up email. But if they have nothing, we can add a little blurb on it for what it is for miscellaneous payments. on our website for you. So, yeah. Okay, Nikki mentions, I'm pretty sure this is about the um, averaging out. The weekend rate is normally higher. It's the nature of the business. Um, even with the higher rate, we still need to itemize it uh, individually. Um, unless there's like two days with the same rate, then you can add a room rate with two days and um, put the memo I don't know, with two days room rate. Um, but they still need to be itemized and separate and not average, unfortunately. And if there is an overage, an overage um, line needs to be added within the itemization. So again, I know um, a lot of people want to average it out, but we cannot accept that. All right, Ellie Hammond asks, is splitting in the works a future change or not even under consideration? To be completely honest with you, Ellie, I don't I do not know. Uh I believe it is something we will bring up in the future state. We always have a list of things that we are wanting to get updated. Uh right now we are mainly focusing on per diem rates and yeah, essentially per diem rates as that is the most urgent issue to make sure those are correct. But that is we have not forgotten about splitting and we do, we would like that. We would like to see that added as well. So it, it, we have, we have not forgotten. I don't have access to the FT system to see what they're working on. So it could very well be that they are, but I honestly could not tell you, but if it does happen and we hear something about it, we'll be sure to let y'all know. Okay, uh, we do have two minutes left, just a time check. So we'll answer as much questions in the next minute or so, and um, everything else will be answered offline. And again, um, we will definitely email you guys post meeting with the video link, Q and A, and the slide deck. Um, but again, we'll go over maybe one or two questions, and then um, we will end the meeting to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, from Jason, can you give um, um, some guidance regarding cash? Um, of course, credit cards, uh, I mean, credit card, I mean, for when credit card and official receipts are not a thing. We have a lot of faculty who travel to the rainforest or to travel areas that deal with barter or cash only. If it's expenses that are miscellaneous that are under the 75% rule, then you wouldn't need technically a receipt for that. Um, 
We also recommend uh, doing a field advance. I believe uh, those would be the most appropriate when it comes uh, to cash payments. Um, we can definitely link that out to you or you can reach out to Global for more um, questions about field advances. But again, um, cash is a situational thing. If you do have another case, please feel free to bring it to us and we can um, figure out what the best solution is. All right. So like Sam mentioned, this will be our last question and then we'll let you all go and we'll send our follow-ups. So last question, Tracy M. Williams says, one of my team heard Renee say that the company should be UW 1861 in the header and School of Medicine in the line item. Just to confirm, was he speaking about employee ERs or was he describing miscellaneous payments as well? And Sally D., who is now thanking us. You're welcome, Sally. Uh, says, both. Only CTA verifications have School of Medicine in both places. And uh, that is correct. Yes. So UW 1861 should be the header for both employee ERs and miscellaneous payments. Only in CTA verifications would you have your specific School of Medicine one in both. And Dennis Fang mentions that miscellaneous payments can use SOM now. And that is good to know, Dennis. So I guess miscellaneous payments, you can also use SOM. Thank you all for coming. And uh, we will be sure to send a follow-up and follow up with any other things we didn't get to, but we will talk to you all on email or on a phone call or on a Teams call or on a, you know, whichever. We will see y'all but thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Bye.